host of benefit challenges and discrepancies currently confronting deployed Federal employees. Federal workers who serve our nation in combat areas of Iraq and Afghanistan and other war zones deserve assurance that the Federal Government has a uniform strategy in place to handle both pre- and post-deployment issues, no matter the employing agency. With tens of thousands of Federal employees having served overseas in combat theater in this decade, it greatly disturbed me to learn comments from a former deployed Federal employee who was gravely injured by enemy fire last year in Iraq, that the military saves your life and gets you home, and then it's totally up to you. In addition to ensuring seamless medical care upon return and efficient and straightforward processing of workers' compensation claims, I believe Federal agencies need to do more in support of these individuals stateside following their deployment in the areas of medical screening, mental health support services, and in dealing with their home and other agencies when filing for benefits and seeking treatment. Unlike their military counterparts, deployed Federal employees do not operate within an established framework and often have to navigate bureaucratic hurdles to get their health care coverage unaided. Given the expanding role of Federal civilian employees in support of ongoing military operations and statecraft endeavors, agencies are in a position of needing to recruit Federal workers who are willing to serve in hostile environments. As a result, addressing pay inconsistencies, leave flexibilities, and holes in post-deployment medical care and workers' compensation are key to guaranteeing such an abundant and dedicated workforce. I would like to thank the witnesses for appearing here today as we take a hard look into what is being done and what options may need to be considered to guarantee that deployed Federal employees, brave men and women who serve their country, and their family members are receiving the proper support and treatment they deserve from a grateful nation. I now call upon the Ranking Member, Mr. Bill Bray, for any opening statement he may have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, let me ask for a unanimous consent to introduce a written statement. Um, I, Without objection. And um, basically, you said it very appropriately. I think that we just got to understand that um, the rule of law has always been a, a cultural given, at least we assumed it been, since. Uh, uh, Me Mesopotamia uh, started using a, a concept on, on clay tablets. So I think that we need to have some kind of understanding of what is um, the, the restraints, where are the limits, and where are the opportunities, and people should know that up front. We, we shouldn't be making the rules as we go on, and I, I think the concept of written law and regulation is just not only a, a, uh, a cultural given in our society, it's, it's common decency. And so I will uh, um, uh, look forward to this hearing. I think that the, the new uh, Bauman administration's commitment to uh, <clears throat> creating a civilian surge in Afghanistan really is an example of where we need to get our act together on this. We need to set out these lines. The new administration obviously expects this to be a critical part of our national presence around the world. So we need to make sure that that presence is under the rule of law. Now I yield back, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman from California. I now call upon the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings. I want to thank the chairman for calling this uh, hearing today. And certainly I thank our witnesses who have come today to examine policy uh, disparities that exist across Federal agencies that deploy civilian employees to serve our country in deployed environments. Since 2001, more than 41,000 civilians have served or are currently serving in Iraq or Afghanistan. One of the realities of fighting concurrent wars in both Iraq and Afghanistan is that our military cannot conduct its missions alone. The military has to use every available soldier on the front lines. Additionally, the nature of how we fight our current enemy has caused us to rely more heavily on civilians not only to provide assistance in service support roles, but also to be actively engaged in the day-to-day -day stability and reconstruction efforts alongside our troops. Rightfully, we go out of our way to ensure that our deployed military troops receive the proper medical and compensation benefits while they fight for our nation. Well, our deployed civilian population should be no different as they face dangerous situations also. Studies have found disparities with approving workers' compensation and post-deployment medical screening affecting benefits, 
regardless of whether a deployed civilian originates from the Department of Defense, the State Department, or the United States Agency for International Development, these volunteers are placed in harm's way and deserve equitable treatment when it comes to medical care, benefits, and compensation. DOD and State already have the infrastructure to provide medical care while civilians are deployed in a theater of operations. But unlike the military, when our civilians return home, their medical wellness is forgotten. We mandate that the military complete post-deployment health assessments to identify symptoms related to post-traumatic stress disorder. Yet, DOD and State are the only agencies that require medical screening of civilians upon return from deployments. Therefore, we need to do a better job of communicating the policies that govern medical care, benefits, and compensation for our deployed civilians. As we have learned from casualty reports, there are numerous risks that a civilian accepts when he or she decides to work in a combat zone. It is no secret that money and benefits are lucrative enticements for agencies to attract individuals willing to deploy. As such, individuals should receive comparable compensation commensurate with their skill levels and the amount of risk involved in their daily functions. Finally, understanding that federal agencies operate under different pay systems, compensation packages will differ to a degree. But the Office of Personnel Management should provide overarching compensation and benefit policy for deployed civilians and the authorities given to the agencies for implementation. Given the course of our military, I do not foresee a change in the near future on our reliance of civilians on the battlefields. As we continue a whole of government approach to stabilizing and reconstructing other regions around the world, we must be creative in utilizing existing systems to meet our current challenges. I, I think that it would be worthwhile to expand existing DOD and state procedures to incorporate the civilian aspect. And Mr. Chairman, with that, I thank you again for calling this hearing, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman. At this time, I would ask the witnesses to stand. It's committee policy that all witnesses before this committee are sworn in. If you would rise and raise your right hand, do you solemnly swear the testimony you will give before the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record show that each witness answered in the affirmative. I thank you. Um, if I may give, give a brief um, introduction to our panelists. Um, Brenda Farrell was appointed to serve as director in GAO's Defense Capabilities and Management Team in April of 2007. She is responsible for military and civilian personnel issues, including those related to GAO's high-risk area personnel security clearances. Ms. Farrell has began a career at, at GAO in 1981 and has served in a number of uh, issue areas associated with national security issues. Uh, Marilee Fitzgerald was appointed as the Director of Workforce Issues and International Programs in the Office of Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Civilian Personnel Policy in June of 2005. Ms. Fitzgerald is responsible for the oversight and approval of the Defense, uh, Department of Defense Human Resource Policies and Programs that affect over 700,000 employees worldwide. She also serves as the Principal Deputy to the Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Civilian Personnel Policy. Uh, Stephen Browning uh, was uh, is Ambassador Stephen Browning, a career member of the Senior Foreign Service, holding the rank of Career Minister. Ambassador Browning assumed his duties as Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of State in the Bureau of Human Resources in August of 2009. Most recently, Ambassador Browning served as Ambassador to the Republic of, uh, Republic of Uganda, which I happen to know is called the Oriental Republic of Uganda. Oh, no, no. I'm sorry. That's Uganda. Mixing it up with Uruguay. Strike that. Prior to that, he served as the Minister Council of Management in the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad. Robin Hurd. Uh, Robin Hurd is the current Deputy Assistant Secretary for Administration at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Uh, Ms. Hurd has uh, also served as Acting Budget Analyst in OMB. Uh, she is not with us today, but I believe that there is somebody here from the Department of Agriculture who can answer some questions. Is that correct? Yeah, okay. Jerome Mikowitz, is that correct, Jerome? 
uh, is the Deputy Associate Director for Pay and Leave Administration for the Strategic Human Resources Policy Division of the U.S. Office of Personnel Management. He is a career member of Senior Executive Service and manages the Center for Pay and Leave Administration responsible for administering dozens of government-wide statutory authorities related to pay, leave, work, and uh, work schedules for civilian federal employees. And finally, but not least, Shelby Hallmark. Shelby Hallmark is the Acting Assistant Secretary for Employment Standards Administration of the U.S. Department of Labor and Director of the Office of Workers' Compensation Programs and is also the permanent OWCP Director. Welcome, all of you. Before we begin hearing from members of the panel, Ms. Norton, uh, the delegate from Washington, D.C., has joined us, and I now call on the gentlelady for her opening remarks. Welcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I wanted to be here for as long as I could. Uh, this uh, subcommittee has done an excellent job of taking care of federal employees at home, uh, but our own work indicates that we've not been nearly, uh, the Congress at least, has not been nearly as vigilant uh, when we deploy, yeah, that's the right word for it, uh, civilian workers abroad. I have visited uh, whenever I visit abroad, in fact, the first people we come in contact with are federal employees just like the ones uh, who are our own constituents here, except there they are, uh, far away from home. And more and more of them have been deployed to combat zones and serve under what can only be called, Mr. Chairman, hardship posts. Uh, try going to uh, parts of Africa and Iraq other parts of the Mideast which are under fire uh, and you're categorized as a civilian, something happens to you there. Uh, you don't have the same access that those who courageously serve us in the armed forces have always had. Uh, and so, unintentionally, there is a distinction among federal uh, employees. Um, we are responsible for them not just in this country but most especially uh, when they are abroad. And Mr. Chairman, uh, I, I recall um, uh, speaking with employees who had been deployed for some time in various parts of the Mideast and, and were astounded to learn, well, one of the complaints indeed was uh, that there has to be turnover. People are, you know, there's, there's too much turnover that our, our employees come for a while and then they go. Well, the reasons are, are very clear. This is hardship uh, with capital letters. They're away from home, from family, and then they have uncertain benefits uh, when uh, they, uh, particularly when they uh, incur unexpected events in their own lives. We have got to make it attractive uh, to go abroad. We've got to make it less of a hardship to go abroad. This is not Paris, my friends. <laughs> These are not posts in uh, the great cities uh, that are legendary in history where in your off hours you can go sightseeing. Uh, I have seen federal employees in places where there was nothing in the evening. I hope they like books, and I think because our our employees tend to be fairly bookish and intelligent and intellectual. They use the time, uh, of course, uh, to, to good effect. Uh, we need to pay the kind of attention you, Mr. Chairman, and this subcommittee is paying now. And I'll stay for as long as I can, but I wanted to be here to thank you and the subcommittee, uh, and particularly to thank the witnesses who come to educate us about these uh, out of sight, out of mind employees of the United States of America serving their country. Thank you again. I thank the gentlewoman from the District of Columbia and, and thank her for her commitment to all of the employees of the federal government. Um, uh, witnesses have been sworn in. I wanted to say to everybody that uh, your entire statement has been entered into the record. Uh, everybody has five minutes uh, in which to summarize uh, their testimony. Uh, the green light will go on to indicate that your five minutes has begun. The yellow light means you have one minute remaining to complete the statement, and the red light indicates that the hook is coming. Uh, so if we could begin with you, Ms. Farrell. I can project, but I think this will be better. 
Mr. Connolly, members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to discuss our recent report on actions needed to better track and provide timely and accurate compensation and medical benefits to deployed federal civilians. As DOD has expanded its involvement in overseas military operations, it has grown increasingly reliant on its federal civilian workforce to provide support in times of war or national emergency. Other federal agencies also play an important role in the stabilization and reconstruction of at-risk countries and regions consistent with a collaborative whole-of-government approach. Therefore, the need for attention to policies and benefits that affect the health and welfare of these individuals becomes increasingly significant. My main message today is that given the importance of the missions these civilians support and the potential dangers in the environments in which they work, federal agencies need to take additional actions to ensure that the compensation packages associated with such service are appropriate and comparable, and that these civilians receive all the compensation and benefits to which they are entitled. My written statement is divided into three parts. The first addresses compensation policies for deployed civilians. Although policies concerning compensation are generally comparable across the six selected agencies that we reviewed, we found some issues that affect the amount of compensation that they receive, depending upon such things as the pay system and the accuracy, timeliness, and completeness of the compensation. For example, two comparable civilian supervisors who deploy under different pay systems may receive different rates of overtime pay because this rate is set by the employee's pay system and grade or band. In April 2008, a congressional committee asked OPM to develop a comprehensive benefits package for all deployed civilians and recommend enabling legislation if appropriate. At the time of our review, OPM had not done so. Also, implementation of some policies may not always be accurate or timely. For example, we estimate that about 40 percent of the deployed civilians we surveyed reported experiencing problems with compensation, including not receiving danger pay or receiving it late, in part because they were unaware of their eligibility or did not know where to seek assistance. The second part of my written statement addresses the medical benefits. We found some issues with policies related to medical care following deployment and with workers' compensation and post-deployment medical screenings that affect the benefits of deployed civilians. For example, while DOD allows its treatment facilities to care for non-DOD civilians following deployment, in some cases the circumstances are not always clearly defined and some agencies were unaware of DOD's policy. Because DOD's policy is unclear, Confusion exists within DOD and other agencies regarding civilians' eligibility for care at military treatment facilities. Thus, some civilians cannot benefit from the efforts DOD has undertaken in areas such as post-traumatic stress disorder. Also, civilians who deploy may be eligible for benefits through workers' compensation. Our analysis of 188 such claims revealed some significant delays resulting in part from a lack of clarity about the documentation required. Without clear information on what documents to submit, applicants may continue to experience delays. Further, while DOD requires medical screenings of civilians before and after deployment, state requires screenings only before deployment. Prior GAO work has found documenting the medical condition of deployed personnel before and after deployment was critical to identifying medical conditions that may have resulted from deployments. The third part of my written statement addresses the identification and tracking of deployed civilians. Each of the selected six agencies included in our review provided us with a list of deployed civilians, but none had fully implemented policies to identify and track these civilians. DOD, for example, had procedures to identify and track civilians, but concluded that its guidance was not consistently implemented. While other agencies had some ability to identify and track civilians, some had to manually search their systems. Thus, agencies may lack critical information on the location and movement of personnel, which may hamper their ability to intervene promptly to address emerging medical issues. Mr. Connolly, that concludes my remarks. I'll be pleased to take questions when the so committee so desires. Thank you so much. Ms. Fitzgerald. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Connolly, Mr. Bilberry, Mr. Cummings, and Ms. Norton. 
I am here today representing the Secretary of Defense and all of our civilian employees who deploy to austere environments like Iraq and Afghanistan. On their behalf, let me thank you for your strong support of our programs and benefits that help compensate and provide incentives for our deployed workforce. The Department of Defense civilian employees play an integral role in supporting our military members around the globe in all types of operations. Since 2001, more than 41,000 civilians have served or are currently serving in direct support of our U.S. military operations, including 26,000 to Iraq and 7,900 to Afghanistan. We are proud of our brave men and women who have served. Their sacrifice, service, and experience are valued, respected, and recognized as career enhancing. Regrettably, our workforce is not immune from the inherent risks of these missions. Some of our employees and their families have made the ultimate sacrifice for our country, for these brave injured and fallen civilians, for all their colleagues who have answered the call to serve, and for all those who will answer the call in the future. The Department is committed to ensuring that these employees have the highest level of support and care as may be, as may be needed to serve our noble mission. The Department has learned that the dynamic and asymmetric 21st century mission challenges require greater and more expeditionary capability within our workforce. In response to these expeditionary missions, the Department developed a new framework through which an, an appropriately sized subset of the Department of Defense civilian workforce is pre-identified to be organized, trained, and equipped in a manner that facilitates the use of their capabilities for these operational requirements. These employees are collectively known as the Civilian Expeditionary Workforce, or the CEW. We have learned that our employees volunteer for these types of assignments primarily because of a desire to serve our country, to witness the results on the ground, to make a difference, and to engage in this type of work. They believe it is an honor and a privilege to serve our country and to support our warfighters. And in return, they bring back broadened perspectives, critical experiences, and a deeper understanding of their role in support of our expanding missions. The men and women who answered this call are making a critical difference. Building a strong civilian expeditionary workforce, however, also requires promoting the right incentives and benefits to help combat the inherent risks of these missions. Thanks to the strong support from Congress, we have been able to offer many additional financial incentives. They certainly include the 35% danger pay allowance and 35% post differential, and allowances and benefits and gratuities comparable to those provided by the Foreign Service. That benefit was offered to all federal civilian employees. They include such benefits as enhanced death gratuity, travel, home leave, emergency visitation, travel, and rest and recuperation trips. Our DOD civilians singled out the authorized R&R trips and the Foreign Service benefits as particularly critical to maintaining a level of effectiveness during these extended months of employment. We've had enhanced FEGLI op um, options from the Congress, approved premium pay cap waivers, the elimination of the aggregate pay, cap pay caps. This incentive permits our deployed civilians to maximize their earning power in the year in which they are serving. In these economic times, this incentive has been most valued and appreciated. The Secretary of Defense Global War and Terrorism Medal and the Defense of Freedom Medal for those who are injured or killed in theater. This one is similar to those of the military's Purple Heart. In terms of medical screening and medical care for deployed civilians, the Department does take seriously the need to protect the health of our deployed civilians and to medically assess all those who serve our expeditionary requirements. And as was stated earlier, prior to deploying, all DOD civilians are required to obtain a physical examination. In addition, they are required to have a pre-deployment health assessment within 60 days prior to their departure. These two pieces of information combined provide a baseline for wellness. Upon their return from deployment, the DOD civilians are required to have a post-health assessment within 30 to 60 days following their return for de from deployment and a health assessment and reassessment within 90 and 100 days from their return. We have also established the Armed Forces Health Surveillance Center, which now collects these data and is able to track and monitor the, um, the completion of both the pre- and post-health assessments. The Department of Defense established medical treatment policies that ensure civilians 
who become ill, contract diseases, or who are injured or wounded while deployed in support of U.S. military forces engaged in hostilities receive medical evacuation and health care treatment and services in our military facilities at no cost and at the same level in service. The Department looks forward to the opening of the National Intrepid Center of Excellence on the campus of the National and Naval Medical Center in Bethesda, which will be the premier health care resource in the Department of Defense for psychological disorders as well as PTSD and traumatic brain injury. And finally, we must address the critical role families play in the support of our DOD civilians who deploy. The Department continues to strengthen its capacity to serve families of DOD civilians better. We require family care plans to ensure that there are powers of attorney in effect, designated beneficiaries, that are, and to ensure that our, benefit, that our families are aware of and understand the benefits and entitlements provided to them through their spouse's employment. Thank you, Ms. Fitzgerald. Thank you. I know we'll get on to uh, elaboration and questioning. Ambassador Browning. Thank you, Mr. Connolly. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Bill Bray, uh, Ms. Norton, Mr. Cummings, thank you very much for this opportunity to testify before you today. I appreciate your interest in the State Department's efforts, as well as those of our sister agencies, to support our employees serving in difficult and dangerous places, including Afghanistan and Iraq. I look forward to sharing with you some of the concrete steps we have taken to address the critical needs of our employees and their families. Under the leadership of Secretary Clinton, our men and women are working to renew America's leadership through a diplomacy that enhances our security, advances our interests, and demonstrates our values. They're doing inspiring work under difficult conditions. Currently, there are over 900 positions where no family members or only certain categories of family members may reside because of dangerous conditions or other severe hardships. In 2001, there were approximately 200 such positions. This steady increase in assignments to difficult and dangerous regions reflects the Department's concerted effort to send the Foreign Service wherever it is most needed. Our men and women are answering the nation's call to service and putting their lives at risk for the American people. The call to serve has been a hallmark of the Foreign Service. We have fully staffed our missions in Iraq and Afghanistan with volunteers. Volunteers who have stepped forward to serve in these highly dangerous yet critical missions. In recognition of their service, we offer a broad package of benefits, incentives, and support structures. This package has improved greatly since when I served in Iraq in 2004 and 2005. Mr. Chairman, let me share with you some of the benefits we now offer to our employees serving in Afghanistan and Iraq that other agencies may also be able to extend to their employees. Hardship and danger pay allowances, overtime or an equivalent payment, rest and recuperation or R&R trips, pay cap increases, and onward assignment preferences. Mr. Chairman, we also know that the medical and mental well-being of our employees is critical, as is support for their families during and after their assignments. To address those needs, we have expanded the medical services available pre-departure, at post, and after completion of the assignment. And we expanded the scope of our family liaison office to provide support to employees and family members during an unaccompanied tour. All employees assigned to Afghanistan and Iraq attend pre-departure training that familiarizes them with security issues unique to combat zone assignments. It alerts them to the causes and the signs of stress-related conditions, and it provides them with techniques for managing the stress of being in a war zone. Following any high-stress assignment, we conduct a mandatory high-stress outbrief that helps employees recognize post-traumatic stress disorder. Our Office of Medical Services established a deployment stress management program with a board-certified psychiatrist to serve as director, two social workers, and an administrative assistant. Additional mental health personnel have been assigned to the health units in Baghdad and Kabul. Employees who are identified as possibly suffering from stress-related disorders and who require treatment that is not available locally are assigned to a six to seven week program of treatment conducted by our medical office. To support essential continued monitoring, we have developed an assessment system for Department of State employees who have served in combat zones to screen for PTSD through our Deployment Stress Management Program. And our Family Liaison Office has expanded in size to work with our families while the employee is serving in an unaccompanied tour. We are currently working with our colleagues at the Office of Personnel Management 
and the Department of Defense to examine the compensation benefits available to deployed civilians to ensure that it meets our needs for recruiting and retention. If changes are needed, the administration will put forth a comprehensive proposal to address the issues identified with the goal of regularizing authorities across the agencies. This interagency approach has made considerable progress and we look forward to working with Congress to support all federal civilian employees serving in zones of armed conflict. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, we believe that our employees and their families deserve comprehensive support before, during, and after their overseas assignments. The need is particularly great for those serving at our most difficult and dangerous posts. The Department of State has worked hard to provide benefits and programs that support our employees, but we recognize that our work may never be truly done as we adapt to a changing world. Thank you for providing me with this opportunity to appear before you and the members of the subcommittee, and I look forward to receiving your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just an advisory, um, uh, I'm hopeful that we can hear the last two pieces of testimony before we break for votes. Votes are going to be called very shortly. Uh, they are at the last votes of the day, so we'll take an appropriate break when, that, when we're notified of that and come back. Forgive, forgive the uh, imposition, but it's the way of the world here in the House of Representatives. Mr. Mikowitz. Representative Connolly, Delegate Norton, and Representative Bilbray. On behalf of our director, John Berry, I want to thank you for inviting the Office of Personnel Management at this hearing today and for your commitment to federal pay and benefits. We are deeply grateful for the service of federal civilian employees deployed to areas of armed conflict. They put their lives in danger and they work under extraordinary challenges to get the job done. OPM is committed to ensuring the government has fair and accurate compensation necessary to attract and retain an effective civilian workforce. Federal civilian employees who are deployed to work in Iraq and Afghanistan and other overseas locations are entitled to compensation that's controlled by three factors, and these three factors influence the application of pay and benefits. First, deployed civilians continue to serve under normal pay system, and most pay and benefits are across the board but some are entitlements um, and some are discretionary flexibilities, but the flexibilities are determined on a case-by-case -case basis. Entitlements include things like annual pay adjustments, step increases, overtime, and leave. Flexibilities are applied on a case-by-case -case basis. For example, the use of recruitment, retention, and relocation incentives are discretionary and may vary based on staffing needs. The rules provide for some exceptions overseas. For example, since deployment to a war zone is considered a life event, employees have an opportunity to elect different health insurance coverage or enhanced insurance coverage. The second factor is that multiple pay systems exist at home and overseas, and employees working side by side in close quarters in combat zones become very aware of these differences. These differences are often based on different mission and workforce requirements and are the result of separate laws that have been authorized over many years. However, current law does allow agencies not otherwise covered by the Foreign Service Act to provide certain foreign service benefits to their employees serving in Iraq and Afghanistan, and this has been very helpful. Third factor is that the standardized regulations administered by the Secretary of State do provide a common framework for payment of allowances and differentials to all civilian employees overseas. Such payments include danger pay and post-hardship post differential, which combined are worth 70% of basic pay in Iraq and Afghanistan. OPM itself administers two special temporary provisions affecting most civilian employees in Iraq and Afghanistan, and we are grateful that Congress has provided them. First, OPM administers a waiver that allows a higher premium pay cap ceiling on the amount of basic pay, basic pay plus overtime and other premium pay. The higher cap permits the payment of premium pay that otherwise would not have been payable. Second, OPM also administers a waiver of the aggregate pay limitation, which means that in addition to base pay, an employees can receive all of their Title V payments the year they earn it instead of having it rolled over to following calendar year. Normally, the limit is the rate for level one of the executive schedule, which is 196700 currently. 
Now I would like to comment on some OPM initiatives. In June 2008, we issued a memorandum to agency chief human capital officers describing the existing pay and benefits available to civilian employees working in combat zones. OPM strongly urged federal agencies to become informed of and to take full advantage of those authorities. In September 2008, OPM wrote to the Committees on Armed Services in the House and Senate concerning the National Defense Authorization Act. OPM supported providing appropriate benefits to employees and combat zones and the extension of existing temporary authorities. We continue to work collaboratively with DOD and state and other agencies to determine how we can provide better and more consistent pay and benefits, and this is a work in progress. So in conclusion, for the changes that we find are needed, the administration will put forth a comprehensive proposal to address the issues identified. We believe that the outcome of this process will also help assure greater consistency in the compensation of deployed civilians. We want to do all we can to ensure that the civilian employees who put their lives on the line for American people are appropriately rewarded and supported by the federal government as their employer. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss this important issue. I'll be happy to respond to questions. Thank you, Mr. Mikowitz. And finally, Mr. Hallmark. Thank you, Chairman Connolly, Ranking Member Bill Bray, and Hallmark, you're going to have to speak into the microphone. Sorry, we can't I'm hear sorry. you. You need, you need to give me that. Thank, Thank you. you. Snatch that away. Thanks. And if so, you could speak directly into that mic. Thanks very much. I don't mean to suggest my hearing is going, but uh, it uh, would be helpful. So people hundreds of years from now none can of hear us, your sweet words. Okay. None of us are getting any younger here. Uh, it's my pleasure to, uh, to appear here today to discuss the Office of Workers' Compensation Program's role in providing benefits to the brave federal civilian employees who serve in Iraq, Afghanistan, and other dangerous areas around the world. We deliver services to these employees under the Federal Employees Compensation Act, or FECA. Uh, starting at the top with Secretary Solis, all of us at the Department of Labor are fully committed to ensuring that our deployed federal colleagues uh, and their families receive the care and compensation they deserve. We know they've undertaken uh, assignments that involve significant hardship, uh, substantial risk, and that their work is critical to the success of American efforts in the Mideast. OWCP has reached out to the Departments of Defense, State, and other agencies to see that workers' comp claims from these deployed civilians are handled promptly and appropriately, and to coordinate on, is on related issues such as pre- and post-deployment counseling. We will continue to work with our sister agencies to make further improvements in the administration of the FECA in this respect, and to assist where we can in the overall delivery of services uh, and benefits to these deserving Americans. To ensure that claims from deployed employees are handled expertly, we have assigned that work uh, to a special unit located in our Cleveland FICA district office. This unit has received special training and experience in dealing with uh, various types of extraordinary claims, uh, including those resulting from overseas injuries. They've developed ongoing relationships with their counterparts at the major overseas agencies, and they work closely uh, with them. For example, as a result of a recent uh, specific agreement put in place following an interagency meeting last year, our Cleveland staff now notify the employing agency whenever they find themselves at the point of needing to deny a claim because they haven't received the information they need to pay it. Uh, that allows the agency the, t the chance to uh, investigate, determine whether there's more information that they can help to provide, uh, or if perhaps the injury is simply resolved. Cleveland has also re relaxed their uh, normal FICA timeliness standards uh, for receipt of such documentation uh, so that there is uh, adequate opportunity to obtain that medical or other information that may be uh, difficult to track down from an overseas location. As noted in my written testimony, FICA coverage for deployed individuals, although not universal, extends to an extremely wide range of circumstances beyond the normal workplace nexus. Uh, this includes while eating, sleeping, and during travel, and a, and a whole range of other circumstances. In practice, the great majority of claims received from Iraq and Afghanistan are quickly and accurately handled uh, and are approved. Of those that are not approved, the great majority involved injuries for which OWCP simply never receives any follow-up medical. Uh, on more severe cases, OWCP engages closely to address ongoing disability or complicated medical conditions and assigns occupational nurses to assist such workers in navigating the medical delivery system and in returning to work when medically able to do so. 
GAO recently conducted a review of our FECA claims process for civilians injured in war zones. Uh, their report included only two recommendations, one suggesting that we provide a better explanation of the type of medical evidence required to support a claim for compensation, and another to speed the issuance of our regulations concerning the death gratuity, which was enacted in the Defense Authorization Act of fiscal year 2008. Uh, that new FECA death gratuity provides $100,000 in benefits to specified survivors of workers killed while supporting a contingent operation such as Iraq or Afghanistan. And our interim final rule was published with respect to that uh, gratuity on August 19th this past month, uh, making that benefit fully operative uh, for deployed civilian workers. With respect to the medical evidence issue, we agree with GAO's recommendation that we review those instructions uh, that, that accompany our uh, claim forms. Uh, and in fact, we expect to issue a separate instruction form for use by deployed federal employees within the next few weeks. And this fact sheet will address coverage issues as well as the type of medical documentation needed in certain circumstances and will be distributed through the key employing agencies as well as via the OWCP website. I'd like to end by commending the actions reported by my colleagues today at Defense and State and at other agencies uh, with respect to the overall health and safety of their employees. Uh, complex issues such as PTSD need to be addressed in comprehensive ways, uh, and many key services must come not after the fact uh, from workers' compensation or medical systems, but in advance via enlightened preparation and assistance on the part of the employer. Uh, in ensuring that workers get, for example, the pre- and post-deployment screening and counseling, these agencies are serving their employees well. They're maximizing their ability to perform uh, both in the stressful environments and when they return, uh, and they're reducing the likelihood of ser serious injury and trauma. Mr. Chairman, I'd be glad to answer your questions. Thank you, Mr. Hallmark, and, and that buzzing you're hearing is a call for votes. Uh, I'm going to start, and then we will if Mr. Bilberry wants to go, he can, or we will uh, uh, recess and reconvene after the series of votes. Um, and thank you all very much for your testimony. And by the way, uh, before we begin uh, my five minutes, I know that if uh, uh, Chairman Lynch were here, he'd want to announce uh, that uh, a wonderful bill has been introduced by myself and my colleague, my friend from California, Mr. Bilbray, H.R. 3264, the Federal Internship Improvement Act, and that this subcommittee would want to hold hearings on that act and I know who are he here, he'd join Mr. Bilberry and me in committing to that and urging our staff to prepare for those hearings. And this was a pay, unpaid uh, advertisement. <laughs> that will teach him for putting me in the chair, right? Uh, okay. Uh, let me ask first, Mr. Mikowitz, um, a little earlier, a, an interagency working group was put together for um, federal employees, civilian employees deployed overseas uh, in the uh, in combat areas. Uh, OPM at that time declined to chair that interagency working group. Why is that? And is that decision now up for reconsideration? And Ms. Farrell, welcome your comments as well if you have any. Mr. Winkwiz. Thank you. Uh, from uh, the way I would characterize it is that we've had a very collaborative approach all along. One thing uh, uh, that you always have to consider is what's going to be your vehicle for introducing legislation DOD Authorization Act certainly has been the vehicle for the premium pay cap and the waiver and for other provisions that, that are in there. The Foreign Service Act sometimes is another vehicle. So DOD uh, obviously having the most employees that are directly affected in any single agency across government took the lead. And we, were, uh, we attended all the meetings. We were working along with them. Uh, the G GAO report did come out, did recommend that we form an executive uh, group or that we uh, submit a legislative proposal. We have continued to work with uh, the uh, uh, agencies. Uh, we've had all of our meetings have not been at Department of Defense, some have been at State. And uh, we are all working for the same end product. And uh, so uh, I think from OPM's point of view, uh, we will be looking at interest uh, government-wide, just as DOD and State are, but, but we'll have a special role. But given that fact, Mr. McQuist, doesn't it make sense for you to chair it? I'm sorry? Given that fact that you're looking at it agency-wide, I mean, uh, federal agency-wide, that it makes sense OPM chair that interagency working group? Um, 
I would say OPM needs to have a leadership role, and we will do that. We'll vet proposals with, um, with uh, the agencies. Some of our proposals might be guidance, but if there's a legislative proposal, obviously we work with OMB, and all agencies get a chance. Thank you. Ms. Farrell. Thank you, Mr. Connolly. Uh, our report had 10 recommendations, and the first recommendation was directed at OPM uh, to lead such a comprehensive review as requested last year by the Oversights and Investigation Subcommittee of the House Armed Services Committee to determine if legislative changes were needed. And we don't want to uh, not give credit to OPM, and especially with DOD, for the meetings that they have had to try to organize uh, such a, a review, but we do think it's time for OPM to step up and, and have the leadership role. As you may know, strategic human capital management has been on GAO's high risk list since 2001, and it has remained on that list as our most recent list was January 2009, where we noted that leadership was needed in this area of human capital reform to make sure that there was a level playing field. And there's much concern about the number of pay systems that we're talking about today that often result in differences in the amount of pay or what pay one receives. And this is a responsibility of OPM where they could step up and show the leadership role. Thank you. Mr. Yes. yes, I'd like to add um, to this. I think the spirit of that recommendation is now in full play because OPM, Department of State, and the Department of Defense are coming together, and including o OMB, actually, jointly. It's almost a triumvirate of leadership. So I think your concerns about having OPM in the lead have been addressed through this interagency working group. They're working as full partners, full leaders in this, and issues such as the disparities in pay systems are being addressed through the proposals that we'll be sending to Congress. Thank you. Um, uh, let me ask again, uh, Mr. Mikowitz and Ms. Uh, Ms. Farrell, and, and uh, we're probably going to have to break uh, after this. Um, increasingly, we're using uh, term limited employees, known as 3161 employees. Um, one of the concerns I would have, and I think this, the subcommittee would have, is with the best of intentions, what happens to those folks should they suffer uh, a medical uh, condition uh, in the service of the country and or should PTSD, uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome, somehow occur or make itself manifest long after the five-year term is over. Um, we know that if you were in the military, we'd deal with that. But if you're a limited-term employer, 3161, presumably we would not unless there are special uh, provisions for that. So I wonder if you'd comment on that. Well, I can say that that's one of the issues we're looking at. Uh, GAO did start with post and uh, or pre and post deployment assessments, but obviously there's traumatic injury and other benefits, and those are on the table for discussions. We just haven't reached an administration position yet, but but we are concerned. Again, this is one of our recommendations. Much is to be learned from DOD in this area of how they have tracked their military personnel and conducted the pre and post and now the re reassessments after deployment. Uh, it's a lessons learned, I think, from DOD of what should be with the civilians because, as we noted in our statement, many of the civilians do not have assessments after deployment and, as you mentioned, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder often shows up six months after they return. We're going to have to vote and we have five votes. The first one is a 15-minute vote. That's the one right now. And then there are four five-minute votes, presuming that's it, and hopefully that's it for the day in terms of votes. So bear with us. It's going to be about, I'd say, quarter, maybe sometime quarter after, roughly, if, if, if you can uh, hang in there with us, because I think there's a lot more we'd like to get to and talk to. Forgive the interruption, but it's, as I said, the nature of the beast here. I appreciate your indulgence. Uh, obviously, one of the things we're going to want to talk about uh, is the uneven, unevenness of how we're treating men and women who serve overseas, uh, and what services are allowed and what services are made available by sufferance, uh, and what, if any, changes we ought to make to try to move more toward a uniform policy and make sure that quality services are available to our men and women who serve overseas. I also want to get back to the problem of um, 
uh, time lags on claims and complaints. Before you go, though, I just might note that the, uh, if the 3161 employees you were just referring to are, I believe, federal employees, so they have FECA coverage regardless of the limitation of their, of their uh, appointment, and that coverage would continue uh, in perpetuity for the latent uh, diseases such as PTSD. Okay. We'll come back. Um, this hearing is in recess until uh, our votes are over and we recall the hearing. Thank you.